historical facts uh, and uh, some data uh, and opinions uh, which uh, are not known to wider public in Europe, uh, but it is important to have critical perspective as it was mentioned in one of our welcoming remarks today. And I would like to start uh, my presentation with the citation of uh, James Mace. Uh, probably you don't, do not know this man, uh, but uh, his story is uh, uh, not less interesting uh, than this citation. Uh, so James Mace uh, has nothing to do with Ukrainians or uh, he has no Ukrainian origin. Uh, he, is, uh, he used to be an American-based uh, historian. And in the 1970s, he focused a lot on the studies of uh, early communist uh, uh, age, uh, I mean uh, the 1920s, 90, uh, 1930s. Uh, and uh, after that, after uh, his PhD defense, he switched to another topic, the topic of uh, Ukrainian Holodomor uh, of the 1932-1933. Uh, and uh, he was probably uh, the first one uh, to call uh, Holodomor the uh, g artificial genocide uh, instigated by Stalin against Ukrainians. Uh, as he used to say um, uh, when he was asked why you do this kind of research, he said, your dad have chosen me to tell their story. Uh, and uh, it is uh, interesting how he uh, ex extrapolate uh, his research to modern uh, times in Ukraine, uh, saying that that event, uh, that uh, artificial famine, which resulted in the deaths of 3.2 million people in Ukraine, uh, uh, led to uh, discontinuity uh, of uh, uh, the generations uh, in Ukraine. And as a result, after the collapse of communism, uh, we had a different situation than it was in Poland, in Lithuania, in Estonia. Uh, because uh, Ukrainians uh, were largely uh, uh, a minority in terms of, uh, and there was no uh, large uh, social consensus on how the country should develop after the collapse of the Soviet uh, Union. There was no consensus on cultural values, uh, on uh, future development, even on the economic model. Uh, and uh, uh, it shows uh, that uh, all that remained after the collapse of uh, the Soviet Union were pretty much the uh, uh, old uh, Soviet structures, but now we uh, try to build our new independent Ukraine. And uh, in this regard, uh, an interesting part of the citation, uh, which is mentioned in the article, uh, Ukraine as post-genocidal society, uh, is this. The main thing is that Ukrainians will never become a full-fledged people and an equal member of European civilization until power flows from the state to a self-organized people able to force those in power to do what the people want. No state will ever make Ukraine Ukrainian. Only self-organized Ukrainians can do this, and I'm deeply convinced they, that they will. James Mace uh, passed away uh, a number of years ago, and this article was written in 2003, so pretty much 12 years ago. But in many regards, uh, the, uh, this article uh, was uh, a prophecy uh, of the revolution of dignity we had in 2013-2014. Uh, National upheaval triggered uh, by the official denial of former Ukraine President Viktor Yanukovych to continue the European integration path uh, turned into the revolution of dignity, the aim of which was to de-Sovietize Ukraine to combat corruption and to ensure the rule of law in the country where police, judges and politicians have long become untouchable. In bloody uh, February 2014, uh, dozens of Ukrainians sacrificed their lives to protect the freedom of their people. However, it has become uh, only uh, the first one in the long uh, uh, row of challenges the country had to face in 2014. In March, Russian annexation of Crimea. In April, uh, Russia instigates separatism in the East. By May, Russia supports referenda uh, in Donbass. August, a large-scale uh, invasion of regular uh, Russian troops in Ukraine. It was really uh, the year of blood and tears uh, in Ukraine. And uh, according uh, to the recent UN figures, 
as of January 6th. In this conflict in Donbass, uh, more than 4,700 people already died, uh, 10,000 people wounded, and there are uh, almost uh, 1.5 million of IDPs and refugees uh, from the conflict area. But uh, I would like to mention that this data is as of 6th of January. You can uh, imagine the scale of the conflict if, uh, if in less than uh, a month, uh, the figure of people dead uh, increased to more than 5,000. However, uh, it, it is a terrible price, but uh, this is a price that Ukrainians are willing to pay to break away from their Soviet past and build up a democratic country that protects uh, the rule of law, not the rule uh, of power. Uh, on the other hand, the Kremlin can't allow this to happen as it sees Ukraine as a prerequisite for its own existence. Uh, so why does Russia want Ukraine and what does history say about the roots of the Russian-Ukraine conflict? It, uh, for this purpose, uh, I would like to use another citation of Zbigniew Brzezinski uh, from his book in 1997 where he says that Ukraine and its very existence as an independent country helped to transform Russia. Without Ukraine, Russia ceases to be a Eurasian empire. But with Ukraine, Russia automatically again regains the wherewithal to become a powerful imperial state. It is interesting that even Russian experts agree with this opinion. Uh, for instance, Lilia Shevtsova, uh, an expert of uh, Moscow Carnegie Center, once said in one of the interviews that Ukraine moving to the West uh, takes away uh, legitimacy of the Russian state uh, and legitimacy, uh, uh, and without this legitimacy, Russians turn into Moscow populated by God knows whom. Then a starting point for Russian history is not a thousand year history of Christianity and Christianization of Kievan Rus, but Andrei Begolubsky of uh, the 12th century, and it is a totally different story. Another opinion, uh, more closer to yours, uh, from France. Uh, why everything happened in Ukraine, and uh, why does Russia want Ukraine? There are three factors that have come to define Vladimir Putin's behavior towards Ukraine. The first is his ego. Second, he strives for revenge in Europe, as he believes that the collapse of the USSR was caused by America, Pope John Paul II, and Europe. And the third is Putin's ideology known as Eurasianism. Ideology is a very important issue uh, when you want to revive uh, the empire. And we see that Russians put a lot of efforts uh, to uh, present their perspective, uh, also, both in ideological terms and in historical terms. And unfortunately, um, this perspective dominates in European mass media. However, uh, I believe uh, that uh, for academic discussion, a more uh, a critical view is necessary. So I would like to focus on three myths uh, that uh, are largely overlooked in Europe, uh, but uh, I will um, present this myth uh, with some uh, figures, facts, uh, and uh, data. And uh, uh, through uh, this method, I, I would invite you to debate and uh, to more rigorous research on Ukraine history without uh, taking the Russian perspective. Uh, so uh, the first myth is uh, that Russia uh, takes its historical background from uh, the times of Kiev and Rus. Uh, but uh, uh, I would tell you about the time framework. The Kievan Rus uh, was a medieval country founded in the 9th century, uh, and it reached uh, its greatest extent in the mid-11th century. Uh, and uh, at that time, uh, it, uh, uh, the state stretched from the Baltic Sea in the north to the uh, Black Sea in the, east, uh, in the south. Uh, however, uh, in the 13th century, it met its demise due to Mongol invasion. And in the period when Kiev and Rus enjoyed the most intensive political, cultural, and economic development, Moscow did not yet exist. Uh, here you may see uh, the map uh, where Moscow uh, is indicated as, small, as a small settlement, uh, which was founded in 1147. 
Moscow became the capital of the Vladimir Suzdal Principality only in 1327. And uh, it became the basis for another country, not Russia, but Tsardom of Moscovy. And the Grand uh, Tsardom of Moscow, uh, or the Grand Duchy of Moscow, was established in uh, 1283 and rebranded itself in the Tsardom of Moscovy only in the 16th century. The idea to extend the historical origin of the state by associating it with the ancient Rus was widely promoted later on by Peter the Great uh, in the beginning of the 18th century. Uh, thus, Moscow used the name to justify its expansionist policy and its historical mission to collect the lands uh, of the former Rus. The result uh, we, uh, is so uh, that now, for many European countries, it is a linguistic challenge to differentiate between the Rus people as the population of medieval country of the 9th, uh, 13th century and Russian people, uh, the country which was founded in the 16th century and is now known as uh, Russian Federation. Another uh, myth uh, which is widely promoted is, uh, uh, it's not rather a myth, but an ideology called the Ruski Mir, and it was introduced by Vladimir Putin in 2006 uh, for the first time, but ever since, uh, NGOs, governmental agencies, uh, and church uh, put a lot of efforts to promote this concept. And uh, this concept basically uh, uh, is lied on three pillars, the Moscow Orthodox Christianity, affiliation to Russian uh, language uh, and Russian culture, and a common historical narrative. The advocates of the concept uh, believe that there are more than uh, 300 million people uh, in the world that may be regarded as Ruski Mir, and uh, this uh, paradigm includes uh, not only uh, uh, post-Soviet uh, countries like Ukraine, Belarus, or Baltic states, uh, but even uh, the countries where the, uh, there are large uh, Russian minorities. So pretty much uh, wherever there are Russians or people that uh, feel some affiliation to Russian uh, culture and uh, this specific historical narrative, they may be regarded as uh, uh, advocates of uh, the Ruski Mir ideology. However, the problem with this concept is that it is oriented toward the past but not the future, and uh, uh, in result it uh, makes the real modernization of Russia impossible, although in today's globalized world it is modernization that keeps countries in the game. Uh, in this regard, an interesting citation by Anton Shekhovtsov, uh, saying that, uh, quote, Ruski Mir is an unwesternizable and unmodernizable community. This is why Putin's Russia is not fascist, or as some commentators suggest, uh, because uh, both uh, Germany and Italy uh, of those times strove for an alternative modernity, uh, rather than rejecting the idea of moder modernization altogether. Uh, however, uh, the ideology of Ruski Mir is totally oriented toward the past and the glory of the Kievan Rus. Uh, in order to promote the ideas of Ruski Mir, in 2007, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, in, of Russia and the Ministry of Education created the Ruski Mir Foundation. And uh, uh, the key goal of this foundation is to promote uh, the ideas, <coughs> the state, state ideology of Vladimir Putin. And now the network of the Ruski Mir Foundation consists of uh, 98 uh, Russian centers in 43 countries, and the, the biggest amount is in Ukraine, uh, 12 of them. It is interesting that they uh, focus a lot on informational work. They have their own radio station, TV channel, online platforms, uh, and even Ruski Mir uh, magazine. And uh, the third uh, myth I would like to focus today uh, is uh, the myth uh, which is used, what was used by Russia to justify annexation of Crimea in March 2014. Russians claim that Crimea is a historical Russian territory with uh, Sevastopol be being a city of Russian military glory. But looking at this slide, we may see that uh, Russian rule over the peninsula lasted only for 135 years. Uh, after 1920, uh, Crimea uh, became part of uh, Soviet Russia, 
but in 1954 it was transferred to uh, Soviet uh, Ukraine. And we may see uh, that this transfer was not free of charge because in uh, 30 years before, uh, in uh, 1924, uh, pretty much uh, similar ter territories uh, were given uh, free of charge to Russia uh, from Ukraine. And uh, the official reason for uh, this gift in 1954 uh, was a celebration of the 300th anniversary of Paryaslav's treaty, um, the treaty which uh, united Russia and Ukraine uh, in one union. However, there is uh, another hypothesis, and to have a critical perspective, we need to take it into consideration as well. Uh, some uh, scholars uh, prove that the initial idea was to put the burden of recovery of this peninsula after the Second World War on Soviet Ukraine, as it had uh, large human resources uh, and it had infrastructure, uh, to recover uh, this peninsula economically, especially after uh, the deportation of Crimean uh, Tatars uh, in 1946, when uh, uh, pretty much 200,000 people were deported to Central Asia. Uh, and uh, it was done, and we may see that infrastructurally, uh, Crimea and uh, Ukraine are uh, one land, one country, and uh, uh, the Ukrainians did this mission of recovery of the peninsula. All in all, uh, and, uh, however, it, it was uh, not a justification, uh, it was not enough argument for Russia, as in 2014, uh, Russia annexed Ukraine Crimea, uh, saying that uh, uh, 1954 agreement uh, uh, does not worth a paper it was uh, written on. In this uh, presentation, I tried to focus a lot on uh, history, and you may say that in current conflict, uh, economics or uh, real politics is of more importance. However, I think uh, that ideological and uh, historical narrative play a crucial role uh, in uh, uh, this conflict because Russia uses uh, uh, the past uh, to uh, promote uh, destabilization in neighboring countries and to promote uh, ideas of Ruski Mir uh, not only uh, in uh, Eastern uh, U uh, Europe but in the world in general. Thank you. Um, thank you to Professor Kovalchuk. Uh, now is the moment of the speech of uh, Professor Oleksi Semenei from Institute for Global Transformations and uh, uh, his uh, speech is entitled uh, Ukraine Crisis 2013-2014 uh,